And Eric Rodilla, followed by Neil Bachman, Tom McIntyre, Joe Malinchek, and as tail end Charlie today, Jerry Wells flying that yellow Stinson 10A. Most of these aircraft were already in production as civilian airplanes, but Uncle Sam said, we need you. Oh, listen to this. That's Yankee Lady going out. You will see her fly later on today. Now these Elbirds, you know it's funny, because the Germans had Elbirds too. And the great thing about these birds is the fact that these airplanes could land and take off in a distance of about the size of a football field. They weren't fast, but the ability to get in and out of remote places really served them well. Here we go, in the lead, it's Eric Radilla. My buddy Neil Bachman from the Golden Age Air Museum is flying aircraft number two there. Tom McIntyre is in the middle, followed by Joe Melinchak. And playing the part of Tail End Charlie, that's the nickname given for the last guy in the formation, is Jerry Wells. You will see Jerry Wells fly again later today in a slightly different yellow aircraft. Now there is a legend out there, and it took me a little while to dig up some information on this guy. I'm sure you're all familiar with the Bazooka Joe bubblegum. Did you know there was a guy by the name of Bazooka Charlie? I'll bet you didn't. Charles Bazooka Charlie Carpenter was a native of Edgington in South Rock Island County out of Danville, Kentucky. Now here's the crazy thing. This man had initiative. And what he used to do was he'd fly his Elbert around. Sometimes he would land and join in the battle if he happened to come across one. He had a rifle inside of his airplane. He'd land, grab his rifle, join the battle. Well, his commanding officer didn't appreciate it. He made it very clear that Charlie wasn't supposed to do that anymore. Well, he didn't listen. As a matter of fact, he went it and took it a step further by putting three bazookas under each wing. Now, the great thing about the bazooka is it's electrically fired. So all he had to do was get some wires and some switches, and he was ready to go. The crazy part about it is this guy actually was very effective called his airplane Rosie the Rocketeer. He went out looking for German armor and doggone if he didn't find it. And he would line up on these things and he'd take pot shots at them. And he never got fired back at. The Germans apparently were pretty surprised. Of course, one of the other things the Germans considered was that if you fired on one of these Elbergs, typically they would get on their radio I call in an artillery strike against the railroad. Not a good move. Well, anyway, he got into a little bit of trouble on a friendly fire incident. Was about to be court-martialed, but General Patton stepped in and said, Wait a minute. This man showed initiative. We're going to promote him. By the end of the war, he got promoted to major... Oh. Actually, by the end of the war, he was Lieutenant Colonel Carpenter, awarded the Bronze Star, the Air Medal with the Oak Leaf Cluster, the Silver Star with the Oak Leaf Cluster. He is credited with taking out several German armored cars, and he immobilized at least 14 tanks, of which he's credited with officially destroying a pair of Tiger One tanks. This guy showed a lot of guts. These airplanes, as you can see, they're not exactly what you call fast. Cruising speed of about 55 mile an hour, typically less than 100 horsepower on board, burning about four gallons of gas an hour. You can fly low and slow with these airplanes, which actually works to help conceal you 
from the enemy. And once again, that steel tube, wood wing, fabric covering, all made them easy to repair in the field should they get damaged. Now, Bazooka Charlie was, was so successful that he had two more aircraft that were equipped with bazookas. And they were flown by Major, uh, let's see, Second Lieutenant, Roy Carlson, Second Lieutenant Harley Merrick. So at one time, there were three of these airplanes running around, making life difficult for the Germans. Well, they deserved it. In the meantime, they were doing all kinds of covert missions. And that's exactly what most of their missions were, covert because of the fact that they're so small, so quiet, and they could fly low to the ground, you really have to be lucky to see one of them as it goes by you. The yellow airplane at the very end there, it's Jerry Wells, tail end Charlie. That is a Stinson, that is a Stinson 10A. The others are either Taylor Craft L2s or Piper L4s. The difference is not that much. You really gotta look at them. And the first place I would start to look at them is the data plate from the original manufacturer. These airplanes are also called war bugs. Now everybody loves warbirds. I have no problem with that. But a warbird is very expensive to maintain, very expensive to insure, very expensive to feed. And with half gas right now being around $8 a gallon, they get expensive to fly pretty quickly. When Uncle Sam was buying the gas, it wasn't a problem. You just say, fill her up, and you're good to go. But today, slightly different. The other thing about these aircraft, being as how they're based on civilian airplanes, they're as easy to fly as the planes that they were based on. The flying characteristics didn't change, even though they modified them slightly. And this is what makes them popular. And there are tons of these things all over the place. It is hard not to go to an airport and see and not see an L-bird of some kind, either waiting to be restored or under restoration or fully flyable with the pilot taking it out just to poke some gentle holes in the sky. They truly are easy to fly. They're also two-seaters. Very often they would go up, the pilot would be looking where they were going, the observer would be taking pictures, making notes, calling in on the radio. He'd be taking care of what's out there and what do we need to worry about. Once again, they're not really very fast, but they were highly effective in the roles that they took. And our pilots, once again, are Eric Radilla. That's him going by. Neil Bachman here right behind him, Tom McIntyre in third place. Then we have Joe Malinchek and Tail and Charlie out there, Jerry Wells. If you ever get the opportunity to fly in something like this, you're gonna love it. It's a very gentle airplane, nice ride. And on a beautiful day like today, I can't think of anything better to do than to pile into my own L-Bird. Well, wait a minute, I don't have one, but if somebody offered me a ride, I'd go. Typically, they have a four-cylinder air-cooled engine up front, although some of, some of them had different engines. Some were powered by Lycoming, some were Continental, others were powered by Franklin engines, if you remember those. They're not fast, but they are fun. Now I believe they're gonna be setting up for their landing here. They're going far out. They're far out there. And in a few minutes, we're gonna be recovering all of our L birds here. And then we're gonna to go to the primary trainers. You're gonna see some big differences in the aircraft as we proceed through our timeline of show activities today. 
Now, the fun part about this is these airplanes have conventional gear. That is, they got two big wheels up front, and they've got a little wheel right on the tail of the airplane. They're also known as tail draggers. <laughs> now, right in front of you there, you have Panchito, which is an example of tricycle gear. Many airplanes that started out in World War II were conve or conventional aircraft. They were tail draggers, P-51, P-47. Not to mention many of the smaller transports like the C-46, C-47. But as the airplanes got bigger, faster, harder to handle, more complicated, they converted over to tricycle gear. Here we go. Two of our Elberts safely recovered on the ground. You may see a variety of landing styles today with, between the Elberts here and the primary trainers. There are two ways of landing these airplanes. You can land on the main wheels only, which is called a wheel landing, and then you keep the tail off as long as you can, or you can do a three-point landing, which is all three wheels touch at the same time. Typically, you only three-point an airplane when the weather is calm. And in a formation scenario that we have going on here, most of these pilots would do wheel landings so they could get out of the way of the pilot that's landing behind them. Kind of important to keep the airplanes apart. And as you can see, all five of our L-birds are safely on the ground. They're going to taxi back to their spots.